I want to invite you as we open our camp meeting together to bow your heads with me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much. We pray that you would help us by your grace. Touch your people once again. We thank you for this camp meeting as we focus on God, as we focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would speak to our hearts. May the Holy Spirit touch us, we pray. Fill us, grant us a special measure of your grace for every speaker, for every individual that will be participating in this camp meeting series as we focus on God. For we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our topic as we open this camp meeting series is entitled, The Personality of Our Heavenly Father. And I want to begin by sharing with you a story of an acquaintance of mine. She got married shortly after graduating from high school, dream husband who had a dream job in another country in South America. And she had everything that she could ever imagine and wanted when she thought about getting married as a young child. This was a good looking man. She had a, a beautiful home and her husband would go to work every day and come back. And it so happened that one day she heard a little bit of news that quite frankly shattered the very foundations of what she thought was her marriage. She got news that her husband was actually the leader of the mafia in town and that her whole marriage was a farce. It was a fallacy. It was built on lies. And as she came to the recognition that the whole fabric and the foundation of what she thought was her marriage was in actuality nothing but a house of cards, the marriage, understandably, just, just fell apart. Uh, they're no longer married to this day. And because of the fact that her marriage and her home life was just a storefront for the other operations that were taking place, and she realized that she didn't even know her husband in the end, and the relationship just fell apart. You can never build a relationship on lies. Some people say that truth and relationality, truth and relationships have nothing to do with each other. But the reality is, friends, that you can never build, build a relationship on lies. They must be built on the foundation of truth because a marriage or any relationship for that matter that is built on fabrication, on lies, on propaganda simply does not work. Did you know? that we live in a world today since the very conception and the inception of sin where the relationship between us and God has been compromised because of the propaganda machine of the devil himself. And there are lies about God. There are lies about his character. There are lies about his personality and the essence of who he really is. And so in order for us to have the optimum relationship with God, in order for us to have the relationship that is built on the foundation of truth, we need to recognize that, that in, in order to have this optimum relationship, we need to cut through the, the fallacies and the propaganda that has been promulgated for centuries regarding the character and the nature and the essence of God. And so that is the premise of our presentation as we open this series, this camp meeting series that we've entitled Focus on God tonight. The opening night is on the personality of our Heavenly Father. The personality of our Heavenly Father. And here is the rub. Here's the issue. How do we know the personality of God? Have you met him before? In person? Uh, I certainly haven't. I, I never had the privilege of meeting face to face with God. So, so how do you know his personality? How do you know his character? How do you know 
what he's really like. This is, this is a question that we have. And I one time was listening to a person on the radio and I had this, this imagination, this mental picture of who this person really was. And then I saw a, a photograph of this radio voice and I was like, oh, I mean, this, this person was nothing like I imagined them to be. Heaven forbid that we, we come in contact with God face to face one day in the resurrection or if you're privileged to be alive when Jesus comes and, and you meet him face to face and imagine, heaven forbid, that you come face to face with him and you're like, oh, you're nothing what I, what I imagined you to be. Uh, you know, quite astonishing. You're the opposite of who I thought you were. I hope that we don't have that experience. I hope that we don't come to the, to the moment of meeting God face to face and suddenly have the shock of our lives in, in recognizing that we were really worshiping a concept, a notion, a fabrication of our imagination that is as far away from reality and we were living really in an alternate universe. How do we know the personality of God? So as we begin our conversation for this opening night of this camp meeting series, I want to expound and elaborate on two key misunderstandings regarding the personality of God. Two misconceptions, two lies regarding his character that has been promulgated throughout the centuries and throughout the, the very inception of sin in heaven and Lucifer's lies and his propaganda machine that has been putting out these ideas into society and into culture. And the reaction has been, we don't want anything to do with a God like that. At least some people come to that conclusion. And so we're going to elaborate on these two misunderstandings regarding God's personality. So here is misunderstanding number one. Are you ready? God is cruel. That is the lie in regards to the personality and the character of God. In other words, God is sadistic, that he derives pleasure from inflicting pain and suffering upon others. This is the caricature, the, the, the idea, the propaganda that has been put out in regards to God's personality, the notion that God is sadistic, that, that God is cruel, that God takes pleasure in, in suffering and in human woe and, and in, in inflicting pain upon the inhabitants of planet Earth. That is the idea that is promulgated. And you have new atheists like Richard Dawkins, who says that God is a sadistic individual, a genocidal murderer that, that takes pleasure in the pain of individuals. Friends, that is a lie. Sad to say, there are individuals that take on the name of Christianity that have ascribed to certain doctrines and certain ideologies and certain theologies that have promulgated and propped up this notion that God is cruel. The 18th century preacher and theologian intellectual, Jonathan Edwards, had a famous, or I should say infamous sermon entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, I want to read you a few excerpts from this sermon. He says, There is nothing that keeps wicked men at any moment out of hell but the mere pleasure of God. The God who holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath toward you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is a pure eyes and to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times so abominable in his eyes as the most hateful and venomous serpent, venomous serpent is ours. And it would be a wonder that if some of you now present should be in hell in a very short time before this year is out. And it would be no wonder if some persons that now sit here in some seats of this meeting house in health and quiet and security should be there before tomorrow morning. Man, I need to take a drink of water after that. This brother is talking about hellfire. And he says to his congregation, I mean, they certainly don't preach like they used to. 
fire and brimstone, and he looks out into the congregation and says, look, some of you may be in hell, and God takes pleasure in the destruction of the wicked, and he looks at you like some loathsome spider or some insect. Fire and brimstone. There's another notion that is promulgated, or I should say another piece of literature called the Apocalypse of Peter. And listen to this, along the same lines as Jonathan Edwards, and besides those who are there shall be other men and women gnawing their tongues, and they shall torment them with red hot irons and burn their eyes. This is talking about hellfire. These are those who slander and doubt my righteousness. Other men and women whose works were done in deceitfulness have had their lips cut off and fire enters into their mouths and their entrails. And these are those who cause the martyrs to die by their living. And yet others near them, men and women, were burned and turned and roasted. And these were those who forsook the way of God. And all those in torment shall say with one voice, have mercy upon us. For now we know the judgment of God, which declared to us before time, we did not believe. And so this idea of God throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity, roasting and toasting and turning people in the ovens of hell forever, and that God takes pleasure in the, in the eternal torment of the wicked is an idea that is propaganda, friends. This is not an accurate picture of the personality of God. We do not serve a sadist, a person that is sadistic, a person that is cruel, a person that takes pleasure in the sufferings of even the wicked for the eternal ages beyond. And, and even in heaven, we'll be able to go down, according to this theology, look down and see the, the destruction and the suffering of the wicked. Now, the reaction to this picture of God, the, the reaction to this idea that God takes pleasure in the suffering of the wicked is atheism. Friedrich Nietzsche, the, the famed atheist, said this, proclaimed to them that there is no heaven to be gained and no head hell to be feared. And as he breathes his last, he will reach out his hand to clasp yours with gratitude. Go and bury him so that you see his face no more, forever removing this burden of God that misguided saints have placed upon us. Lie number one. The number one conception, misconception regarding God's character and God's personality is that he's cruel. That's a lie, friends. That could not be farther from the truth. Now, I recognize that there are certain events in history, like the Holocaust, that, that are very difficult for us to grapple with. Now, we'll be touching on that here in a little moment. But I want to read you this statement from the Supreme Court Justice Ham Kuhn. And he says this, I would say in his name that the Holocaust is final conclusive proof that there can be no God. If there were a God, he would not be a just and merciful God, but a cruel and unjust God, a God of inequity, not a God who does not slumber and sleep, who watches over his people, or over all to tribute to God cruelty, injustice, and inequity. We, if I may say so, should do him the favor of denying his existence. Listen to what this Supreme Court Justice of Israel is saying. He's saying the Holocaust is proof that God doesn't exist. Because if God really existed, he would have stopped the Holocaust. And if, if he does exist, he, he is a, a God of, of cruelty, of injustice, and inequity. Now, before we go on, I want to touch on this notion of eternal burning hell. And I know that there's some passages that seem to point toward this idea of eternal torment. But, but stay with me, friends. You may have some background. Maybe you have some Baptist roots. And, and we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And we want to go to the Bible 
because the Bible is the only way that we can really know what the personality and the character of God is. So I just want to spend a few moments here and touch on this idea of eternal burning hell. What does the Bible say? Here it is, Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Last book of the Old Testament, chapter 4. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. I will leave them neither root nor branch, but to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. Listen to this part. I'll skip down to verse 3. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Did you hear this? The Bible says that the ashes of the wicked will be trampled under the feet of the righteous. In other words, the wicked will be no more. Ashes alludes to the reality that they will be burned up. They're not roasting and toasting for the ceaseless ages of eternity. Quite the contrary, the Bible points out that they will be ashes. Now, how do we reconcile statements like this? And, and also the Bible points out that the, the righteous will inherit the earth. Now, if, if we're going to inherit the earth and, and the earth is going to be some cauldron of an eternal burning fire for the ceaseless ages of eternity, um, maybe hell is in the center of the earth, as some people may believe. But, but that's not what the Bible is saying here. It says that, that the wicked will become ashes. They will be burned up. Now, there are references in Scripture where the Bible says that the wicked will burn forever and ever, such as in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. The word forever is, is used in different ways. For instance, Jonah in Jonah chapter 1, verse 7, in two, cha chapter 2, verse 6, uh, the Bible says that Jonah was in the belly of the whale forever. In other words, it seemed like forever. So, so there's some nuance to this. And also in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 22 and 28, the Bible says that Samuel will serve in the temple forever. Now, Samuel, last I checked, is not in Shiloh or in the temple right now serving God forever, he died. And so the Bible seems to indicate that the term forever does not always mean eternal. In other words, it can also mean as long as the life shall last. So the results of hellfire are forever. These individuals will not be given a second chance, but it doesn't mean that they will live forever because in reality, eternal burning hell is a form of eternal life. In actuality, it's a form of eternal life during a duration of, of torture. It's an eternal life of torture. And the Bible says that the, that the free gift of God is eternal life, not eternal torture. So in reality, the term forever means as long as the person lasts, as long as the person lives, and also an indication that the results of hellfire are terminal. They are forever. Now, what is the real personality of God in reference to this idea of God being a sadistic, individual that is cruel, this misconception, this propaganda that's been put out into society to this very day by the new atheists. Here's the Bible. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Did you hear that? The Bible says, God takes no pleasure in human suffering. That's the truth. That is the personality of God. Compassion, sympathy, empathy. He connects with human suffering. He cares. We do not serve the God of Jonathan Edwards. We don't serve the God that roasts and toasts people for the ceaseless ages of eternity. The personality of God is the most caring person in the entire universe. That's the God we serve. 
So misconception number one, in regards to the personality of God, God is cruel, God is sadistic, he takes pleasure in inflicting suffering upon the inhabitants of planet Earth. And then we come to the misconception number two, that God is indifferent. So <laughs> you have quite the spectrum here. Uh, on one end of the spectrum, you have a God that is sadistic, uh, sadistic a God that, that, uh, that takes pleasure in the sufferings of humanity. And then, and then you have the, the God that is indifferent, the God that, is, that has apathy. He, he just doesn't care. He's, he's up in heaven and just sitting on, on his, uh, his, his throne, maybe sipping lemonade while we're here all groveling on planet Earth, suffering. He's, he's indifferent. He doesn't care. That's the other misconception that individuals have. And it's interesting because the Bible does seem to bring out this, this idea of, of why doesn't God stop suffering. So here it is in Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 13. Minor prophet of the Old Testament, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? Did you hear Habakkuk? <laughs> He's saying, um, look, God, you're, you're, you're watching righteous people suffer down here, and uh, why, why don't you do anything? Uh, why don't you say anything? Why don't you intervene? Surely you should step in when the wicked are devouring the righteous. He says, why don't you stop it? Why don't you stop it? And here's the assumptions of what Habakkuk is saying. You hate evil. You're witnessing evil. Why don't you stop it? I mean, it's like me. You know, if I saw someone hurting my child, uh, my son or my daughter, and I had the ability and the power to stop them, wouldn't I? Absolutely. A caring father would. You would hope that I would, and every, you know, every, every emotion within me would be crying out to stop the perpetrators that are hurting my children. And here Habakkuk is saying, look, you're, you're like the uncaring parent. You just stand by and you let it happen. I had the opportunity to go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And if you ever have a chance to go to Washington, D.C., I, I encourage you to take a visit. It's worth it to go to the Holocaust Museum. Uh, you, you go in there. There's, there's millions of people that go there every year. And uh, you, you go in there, and it's an unusual experience because you... Uh, start in an elevator, and they have limited uh, ability for, for the people to go through at one time. So you, you basically go in an elevator. I forget how many people are able to go in there, maybe six or seven. And, and they take you to the top floor, and you work your way down. And I remember we got in the elevator, and it's kind of this eerie silence because there's a, there's a video that's playing from the 1940s of, of the American soldiers that were liberating parts of Germany, and then they came across these concentration camps, the death camps of the Nazis and the SS soldiers. And, and so then, then the elevator's doors open. It's like, and, and you walk out. And everyone is quiet, at least the times I went there, because you are so in shock by the images uh, of the extermination of six million men, women, and children in cold-blooded genocide. I just, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. Uh, you go into a room and it's just full of shoes that they would confiscate from these men, women, and children. And it broke my heart. I saw a little shoe like this big, it's the shoe of a child. And they would basically separate them men and women and those that were able to work were preserved for a little bit and then the 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 weak uh, the children and the elderly were were put into the crematoriums and burned dr mengele would be standing there and say left right left right and and it was like cattle being led to the slaughter 
And uh, they had pictures of all the hair that they would shave from the Jews in these concentration camps. And, and it was just this moving experience. I, I, I remember watching these videos, oh, it's horrific pictures of, of Dr. Mengele doing experiments on children. Um, putting them in freezing water and then putting them in, in a cauldron of hot water just to see what would happen. I mean, I don't even want to talk about the things that were done in the name of science and medicine. I mean, there were some egregious ethical boundaries that were being crossed in, in a violation of the Hippocratic Oath. I mean, all of these things are going through my mind as I'm going through the Holocaust Museum. And then at the end, there was uh, these testimonies of Holocaust survivors and uh, just broke my heart. And one lady got on there and she says she uh, was in the concentration camps looking through the barbed wire and in front of her a truck came, came and out the back of the truck fell uh, these children. And uh, she says that and I don't want to go into great detail, but she says that the guard came out and just took those kids and just threw them in the back of the truck like a rag doll. And she said in that moment, she stopped believing in God. Stop believing in God. That's what she said. And you could just sense the anguish of of individuals that had survived. And the question is, why? Why didn't God stop it? Elie Wiesel, in his book, Night, which I reread just a, a month ago, uh, he was 15 years old when he was taken to the concentration camps, uh, was taken to Auschwitz with his dad. And uh, it, it moved me, being a father, because his dad was around 50 years of age. He was 15, and, and you could just sense the, the, the father's love for his son. And, and uh, his, his dad would, would, uh, would trade little, little bits of rubber that he would find in the concentration camp. He'd trade it for, for a morsel of bread, because that's all you got. You got, you got one ration of, of an ounce of bread and some watery soup, and, and you were withering away into nothing. And, and so bread was, was the essential commodity in, in Auschwitz. And so the father would, would, would say, son, I, I got you some bread, an extra piece of bread, and he would give it to him. I remember the story of how his dad was up for selection, and, and he, he, was, he thought he was going to die because his dad was getting weak, and his dad goes to, to, to Ellie and says, here's my toothbrush. You'll, you'll need it. Here, here's a spoon. Here's a little knife that I found. Here, here, take it and presses it into the hands of his son. And Ellie's like, Dad, Dad, uh, no, 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 you, you need it. And he says, Son, please, please take this. Um, he tells the story of how his dad was dying in, in the concentration camps. And they're, they're all lying down in the bunks. And... Uh, and uh, his, his dad is a few bunks away. And his dad says, um, Ellie, come to me. Uh, I need to tell you something. Please come to me. Ellie, Eliezer, come to me. And he said uh, he didn't want to go. Ellie said, I just wished my dad would be quiet because if he got up, the SS guards would beat him. And so he just ignored his dad and sure enough, the SS guards came and beat his father. And the next morning, he went to check on his dad, and his dad was gone. They had moved his body to the crematorium because he had died that night. And Ellie says, I, he could never forgive himself for not going, or at least trying to go to his father. And he says, I'll never forgive the world for putting me in that position. Heavy thoughts. He, he tells one story of how a boy was in the concentration camp and he said that the boy's face was like that of an angel. It was so innocent, so pure. And because of an infraction, his, the, the boy was condemned to be hanged on the gallows. And as, as a form of an example, all the inmates, the hundreds of inmates, were forced to watch this execution. And so they brought the boy in front of everybody. 
put the noose around his neck, and the trap door was sprung. And horror of horrors, the, the boy's weight was insufficient to bring instant death. And so he's hanging on the gallows for 20 minutes while everyone with bated breath and just emotion is just watching him die. And behind Ellie, he hears a voice saying, where is God? Where is he? Where is God? Where is he? I mean, what, what do you do with questions like this? I mean, the, the, the logical conclusion that very sincere individuals have is that, is that God is indifferent. I mean, if God exists at all, some people have come to the conclusion that the Holocaust means that God doesn't exist. But, but if God does exist, either he's cruel or he's indifferent. That, that's the conclusion that people come to. And, and here Dostoevsky in his book says, if all must suffer to pay for the eternal harmony, what do the children have to do with it? Tell me, please. What about the children? What am I to do about them? In other words, Dostoevsky is asking a very pertinent question. You know, we, we suffer many times as, a, as adults because of the foolish decisions that we make, the consequences for our decisions. Um, sometimes suffering is, is for our sanctification, you can argue, from a biblical perspective. But what do we do with the suffering of innocent children? Shouldn't God at least step in to stop that? And that's Dostoevsky's, Dostoevsky's question. What about the children? What am I to do about them? Harold Kushner uh, wrote a book called Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. And it really came out of a personal experience because his son got a rare genetic disease called progeria. And progeria hyperaccelerates the aging process. And maybe you've seen photos, these horrific photos where you have children, eight, nine, 10 years of age that look like geriatric. They look like they're 90. They're, their body's like 90 year olds and, and they're all shriveled and bald. And, and they're, they're, it hyperaccelerates the aging process. And they, they don't make it many times past adolescence. And so horror of horrors. I mean, I have a son and I, I can't even imagine what this would have been like. Um, to have your son have this, this disease, and it's so unnatural because parents were never meant to bury their children. Well, we never meant to bury anyone, but I mean, especially, you know, you always think that uh, your, your, your children are gonna outlive you, but here, Harold Kushner's son, diagnosed with progeria. He's watching his son literally age right before his very eyes, and he's dying. He buries his son. And as he's burying his son, his whole theology in regards to God, his nature and his character came crashing down around him. And this is the conclusion of Harold Kushner. Either God is loving or he's all powerful, but he can't be both. Either God is loving or he's all powerful, but he's certainly not both. And you can understand his line of reasoning. Just, just follow with me here. This, this is the line of reasoning of Harold Kushner. Harold Kushner is, is postulating. He's, he's contending that if God were loving and all-powerful, in other words, he cares. He's the epitome of care. He's the definition of love, and he's all-powerful. In other words, he doesn't just care. He has the ability to intervene and save my son's life. But the fact that he di didn't, the fact that he doesn't, is proof that these two elements do not coexist in the nature of God, all loving and all powerful. Because if it, if it did, he would have stopped my son from dying. You can see his, his rationale and his reasoning. If God was loving and all powerful, he would have stopped this insanity of my son from dying. And so Harold Kushner came to the conclusion that God was all loving, but he was not all powerful. In other words, God is the very definition of love. He cares, his heart breaks when he sees the death of children, especially the, the sufferings of all humanity. But Harold Kushner's God cares, but he can't do anything about it. It's as though, 
you know, the sin problem is like this snowball that's, that is going down this mountain and got so big that even God couldn't stop it. And so that was how God could be, could be conceptualized from the experience of Harold Kushner. God is all loving, but not all powerful. What do we do? What do we do? Now, I respectfully, even though I sympathize with Harold Kushner and his experience, and I can understand why he would come to this conclusion, I, I, I respectfully disagree with his position. And I'll tell you why. The Bible. The Bible is very clear. Is God all-powerful? The Bible says, for with God, all things are possible. The Bible says in Jeremiah, nothing is too hard for God. The Genesis account, God speaks things into existence with the very word. You have the incarnation, the virgin birth, the resurrection. All of these attributes and, and activities point toward the reality that God is omnipotent. In other words, he can do anything. So, so that's a non-negotiable fact. I mean, the God of Harold Kushner is a God that loves, but is not all powerful. But the God of the Bible is one that God is all powerful. He can do anything. The, the other part is, look, God is love. That, I mean, that's, that's, that's uh, an idea that, that many people believe he's the very definition of love. Now, I want to get a little bit philosophical here and just, just stay with me for a moment. Because when we think about omnipotence, um, all-powerful, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that God can do anything. Now, before you turn this thing off and you're like, oh, this, this, this guy's a heretic, I, I, want, I want to read you a statement here from, from Augustine. He says, we do not lessen God's power when we say that he cannot die or be deceived. This is the kind of inability which removed would make God less powerful than he is. God is rightly called omnipotent even though he's unable to die or be deceived. It is precisely because he's omnipotent that for him certain things are impossible. Now, I know we're getting a little bit philosophical here, but follow me. God cannot die. God cannot lie. God cannot be deceived. Now, you say, didn't Jesus die at the cross? Yes. But, uh, but if you read a statement in Ellen White's writings, which is a mystery, uh, she says that divinity never died. Now, I don't know how to do the calculus on that. Um, it's a mystery. But, but just, just the idea of omnipotence, I mean, there's certain things that omnipotence has that, that if he was able to do that, it would no longer be omnipotence. And now here's a question that people ask all the time. Can God make a triangle with four sides? Uh, because if you make a triangle with four sides, it's no longer a triangle. I mean, the very definition is, is, is three sides. Can God make a circle with a square edge? Well, a circle doesn't have edges that are square. It's the definition of a circle. Now, I could care less about these questions. But here's a question. Can God make a love that is forced? Can God make a love that is coerced? And here's the thing. Once you force love, it's no longer love. Just like once you make a triangle with four sides, it's no longer a triangle. Just like you make a circle with a square edge, it's no longer a circle. Once you force someone to love you, that is not love. The very definition of love means volition, free will, and choice. So you can see the combination of these two elements of omnipotence and love actually puts God in, in a situation for, for the for the. For, for the sake of relationality, for the sake of optimum, an optimum relationship with humanity and with all created beings, it really places God in a certain situation of, of if I would say, limitation, because God is love, which means integral, 
for love to exist, there has to be free will and choice. And added to it, omnipotence, which has some inherent limitations that we just talked about, you combine them together and you have this reality that, that God would create free moral agents that would have the ability to choose. And perhaps, just perhaps, from a biblical perspective, the idea that, that suffering, that sin, really points toward the reality of the omnipotence and love of God. And that it makes room for, for the, the possibility and the probability that there would be a free moral agent like Lucifer, who later became Satan, that would stand up in heaven and say, no, I choose not to love you back. And God, because he's the very definition of love, would allow that to take place. And that's exactly what happened. Now, this doesn't answer all our questions, why God doesn't intervene. But the reality is that philosophically, that theologically, the notion of omnipotence and love can coexist, contrary to Harold Kushner's belief that they are antithetical to each other in the context of the suffering of his son. But, but you can see that in reality, the existence of love and omnipotence can coexist with free moral agents who choose not to love God back and hence the suffering on planet Earth. Now, the, the quintessential question always comes up in all of this, why? Why my suffering? You know, perhaps you've lost a loved one. Perhaps you've gone through trials and tribulation. Maybe you have terminal cancer. Maybe, maybe you've lost children and you're asking, you know, why? I mean, it sure seems like God is indifferent and maybe you've prayed for your son or your daughter to be healed and, and they died. And, and you're wondering why God didn't intervene. Now, in Job chapter 1, we, we have this, this fascinating dialogue that takes place between God and Satan and they're discussing Job, and, and, and the curtain, as it were, is pulled back, and you're able to, to see into the inner sanctum of the court of heaven and see the conversation that takes place. And it's the great controversy theme, and, and many of you know the story. They, they have this conversation, and God and Satan strike a deal. <laughs> How convenient. <laughs> you would think, poor Job. And so, so God is like, okay, well, you can test him. You, you can see whether Job is really going to be faithful and whether he, he is really serving me from an altruistic standpoint and not because of all the goodies that he's getting. And so God permits Satan to, to go down and wreak all kinds of havoc and he loses everything. He loses his 401k, he loses his Ferrari, he loses his mansion, he loses his, his stock option, and to add insult to injury, he loses all his children too. They are, they are just, they're just destroyed. And then his wife, who's preserved, who doesn't end up being the greatest blessing, says, Job, curse God and die. So that's the frame, and that just happens in the first two chapters, which sets up the rest of the book. Now, now the book of Job goes on for chapter upon chapter, and uh, uh, the majority of the book of Job <laughs> is, is Job talking to his three friends, if you can call them that. And uh, they sit down and say, Job, the reason why you're suffering is because you're a sinner. I mean, that's the theology of the time, and Job says, I'm not a sinner. And they go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And, and the, the majority of the book of Job, so, so, so look, at, look at the book of Job from a structural standpoint. You know, the beginning of Job, uh, conversation in heaven, all this suffering, and, and then the rest of the book of Job is basically, why? Why? Why, God? Why, why me? Why, why, why me? Why, 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 why? And then, um, so, so that's kind of our existence right now. You know, we're, we're, in, we're, we're in the middle of the book of Job. Why, 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 why? And uh, so in, in Job chapter 38, uh, God clears his throat. <clears throat> and he's like, uh, let me say something. And uh, he says, who is this that darkens counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you will answer me. Uh, Job's like, why God? Why God? Why God? And then God's like, <clears throat> let me ask you some questions. And look at these questions. There's 64 questions, by the way, if you count them. He says, where were you when you laid the foundation of the world? Tell me if you understand. 
who marked off its dimensions, surely you know, who stretched out its measuring line. When the morning stars sang together and the angels shouted for joy, have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? I mean, he goes through all these questions. And, the, and then at the end, Job is like, uh, I don't have the answers to those questions either. And then the assumption of the book of Job is basically God never answers the question why. And he ends with a bunch of more questions. And Job says, basically, look, come to find out. There's a lot of things in life that I don't understand. And yet... I accept. The implication is, is trust me with the, with, the, with the questions that you simply don't understand. Uh, the, the, I guess this is kind of a frustration about the book of Job because there's never really an answer. Not even really an answer. There is no answer to human suffering in the book of Job. I mean, we just know how book, the book of Job ends. Job chapter 42, verse 12 now, the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. In other words, there, there's, there's a, a capstone to this. It, it ends with a happy ending where, where Job is, is restored everything that he lost. So in the beginning, he loses everything. In the middle, the majority of the book of Job is asking the question why and, and God asking more questions at the end to which he doesn't answer anything to those questions either. And then, and then Job is restored at the very end. And so we're living in that parentheses right now. And so God is saying, look, with what you know about my character, my nature, and my essence, trust me with the things that you do not understand. Misconception number one regarding the character and the nature of God, that God is cruel. That's a lie, friends. Don't believe it. Don't buy it. That is not the God of the Bible. And lie number two is just as bad, that God is indifferent, that he doesn't care. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, the Bible says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot be sympathized with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Look, there's going to be questions. There's going to be things that we don't understand, but we can know that the God of heaven really does understand our sorrow and our suffering. So here's the question. How can we really know the personality of our Heavenly Father? That is the quintessential question of the ages. I mean, how do we know? What's he, what's he like? Here it is, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is found in the face of Jesus Christ. In other words, friends, the Bible says, if you've seen me, Jesus, you've seen the Father. I mean, so sometimes we have this picture that, that the Father is this, is this vindictive, cruel individual, and Jesus is down here mediating and so forth, try, trying, to, trying to patch things up. That's not, the, that's not the truth, friends. The reality is that Jesus is the representative of the Trinity. He, he's the public relations individual, for the lack of a better phrase and role. In other words, if you want to know the personality of the Father, look at the face of Jesus Christ. He is the invisible God made visible in human form. Divine accommodation. We weren't able to look at the face of God, and so Jesus tabernacles with humanity. He becomes as one of us. And, we, and, and before, we weren't able to look at the face of God and live, but Jesus veils his divinity in humanity. And he tabernacles with us so that when we look at the face of Jesus, we can look at the face of God. Praise his name. And so we don't have to be in the dark. We don't have to be in an anxiety wondering if one day when we get to heaven, we're going to be shocked that, that God is nothing like what we thought he was. In reality, you can look at the face of Jesus today. Now, you may be like, oh, how can I look at the face of Jesus? You know, Jesus lived 2,000 years ago and he ascended on the, uh, after, after, uh, after three days and then he walked 40 days on planet Earth and in the book of Acts, he ascended to heaven. So, so how can I look at the face of Jesus if he's in heaven right now as our high priest. Well, I have good news, friends. Steps to Christ. Highly recommend this book, by the way. 
page 88. If you would become acquainted with the Savior, study the Holy Scriptures. Did you hear that? Right here. Jesus is in heaven, but Jesus is also the Word. And so every day, as you open Scripture, as you go through the Gospels, as you get to know the personality of God as found in Scripture, you are looking at the face of God. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is found in the face of Jesus Christ. Study the word, friends. Get to know scripture. Live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. These are spirit. This is spirit. This is life. And when you read the text of scripture, you can be changed from glory to glory, from faith to faith, and from day to day. We serve a God that loves us and that is the epitome of love for each one of us. God bless you and keep you to that end.